Creating an inclusive workplace isn't as simple as hiring a diverse workforce. It requires an intentional approach to ensure that employees feel welcome, included, and both mentally and physically safe. Exclusion in the workplace is not always an intentional act. Institutional, structural, and systemic racism are factors that exist within our systems and actions that are both blatantly and subtly racist. Understanding that there are often systems and practices in place that enable exclusive workplaces and hiring practices is an important step to ensuring that your organization fosters an equitable, inclusive place to work. Implicit bias occurs unintentionally and oftentimes unknowingly at the individual level due to the practices that built systemic and structural racism. Implicit bias is often shaped through experiences and interactions that lead to perceptions of others based on particular characteristics, qualities, or social groups. For example, if I say water operator, you may be more likely to envision a man, whereas if I say city clerk, you may be more likely to envision a woman. Intent and impact can be competing forces we are often unaware of our implicit biases and the influences of systemic racism on our actions and language. However, they are contributing factors to unintentional negative impacts. Positive intentions can have negative impacts. For example, your boss implements a new time tracking policy as a way to ensure that work is being done in the most efficient way. However, the new policy is viewed as more work and micromanaging. The intent was to create a more efficient process, but the impact was demotivating. Structural racism throughout history is still impacting historically excluded groups today. Settler colonialism embedded structures within our systems that are still impacting indigenous peoples through income and wealth inequities and environmental degradation. Impacts from slavery, Jim Crow laws, and segregation are still observed in our justice and education systems, as well as in housing, food, and transportation. People of color experience disproportionate punishment for breaking laws and are more likely to experience police brutality. Disenfranchisement practices such as voter suppression and rigorous ID laws place unnecessary burdens on people's ability to exercise their rights as members of the United States. Gentrification leads to challenges to obtaining housing, transportation, to school and work, and access to food and resources for quality of life. Unconscious or implicit bias can impact our decisions when recruiting new staff. It's not intentional, but something we've been conditioned to do, where stereotypes and assumptions affect our decisions. We also tend to be drawn to people who are like us, who look like us, have similar beliefs or backgrounds, and maybe even people who went to the same school as we did. So it's important to take steps to counteract this bias from the hiring process. Ensure you have a diverse selection committee. That includes diversity in race, gender, and levels of the organizational structure. Provide unconscious bias and DEI training for search committees to help them become more aware of their own biases. Remove names and other identifying information from application materials. Have a standardized interview process. Consider what you mean when you say things like, I just don't think that candidate is a good fit. How you recruit makes a difference, from writing job descriptions and managing hiring processes on through to the type of work environment you cultivate. Understanding gender bias language in job postings and descriptions is one way to encourage all gender identities feel that your organization is an inclusive environment. Be mindful of using gender-specific pronouns in advertisements. Also avoid using gender-specific titles, especially for roles that have been historically held by men. Rather than a lineman, use line worker. Rather than chairman, use chairperson. Rather than councilman, use council member. Gender-coded words are often part of the implicit bias that exists in the workplace. Historically, words that described predominantly male roles include confident, decisive, driven, logical, while work that describes predominantly female roles includes collaborative, sensitive, and understanding. 
Using words that convey the organization's need while keeping opportunities open for all is another key step to fostering an inclusive workplace, especially for physical job requirements. For example, rather than explaining that a person will be in one place for long periods of time, mention that the employee will remain stationary. Rather than saying employees will need to walk to get to resources, use words like move. Reaching out to a broad spectrum of audiences can assist with developing a diverse workforce. To encourage a diverse group of candidates, seek out new sources and organizations you don't typically go to or that have a more diverse audience, such as newspapers printed in languages other than English, organizations that support communities with specific demographics, and organizations that host workforce programs. Assessing your workplace is another step in establishing a more inclusive environment. One useful approach is leading with empathy. Empathy, by definition, is understanding and being aware of and sensitive to the feelings and experiences of another person. It's sometimes described as putting yourself in someone else's shoes to try to feel what they feel. And that's okay as a basic definition, but it assumes that we fully understand another person's lived experiences, when in reality, that may not be possible because of the complexities and nuances that exist around each situation and the impacts of differing identities, including gender, race, ethnicity, ability, and orientation. To be truly empathetic, we need to be able to acknowledge that we can't always understand what others are going through, but that we still believe their experiences to be valid and true. It doesn't require having a shared experience, just sharing in the emotional response to that experience. Take some time to assess your work culture, to understand how others are experiencing it. What are some existing policies, procedures, and practices that should be evaluated? Then develop a plan to go about answering some of these questions and identifying additional resources that you might need to be successful. Here are just a few questions you might use when evaluating your workplace culture. What are some of the characteristics of a good employee? What characteristics are rewarded in your organization? How are written and unwritten rules learned? What behaviors are considered uncomfortable and for whom? Who speaks up in meetings? Who's not given space to speak? Who is involved in decision making? And who defines what success looks like? Thinking about your physical space from a diversity and inclusion perspective, a few questions you might consider to help assess those spaces include, are the spaces you work in and invite others into accessible to everyone? Is the furniture in your office arranged in such a way that a person using a wheelchair can comfortably enter and interact with you and others in that space? Do employees and visitors have access to gender neutral restrooms and lactation rooms? Can you create a quiet space for employees to participate in religious practices, meditate, or even just get away from the overstimulation of other shared spaces. In summary, understanding various biases helps to identify ways to foster an inclusive workplace. Inclusion starts with recruitment and continues through frequent evaluation and adjustments. And inclusion means providing mental and physical spaces for all to achieve success. Thank you for spending some time learning about the basics of diversity, equity, and inclusion. To learn more about the Work in Water program through the Environmental Finance Center at Wichita State University, visit wichita.edu forward slash work in water. For questions or more information, please contact us at efc at wichita.edu.